Uh, hello everyone welcome to our listeners and welcome to the people that now watch us on youtube which is great we've got a growing audience there as well so thank you um today we've got jason repulse here today with us i'm very happy to have him along um and i'm i'm really not going to change the question i mean i've had a few people say on our on our kind of podcast so you're going to ask a different question and i'm like no we always want the background in what people say so the question is going to be the same kind of walk us through the journey you've taken and kind of how did you end up where you are today yeah, well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm excited to talk with you both today. Uh, so I, I've had a, a pretty, uh, what I think is a unique journey into uh, cybersecurity. Uh, it's really started when I was in high school. Uh, and I started to learn how to program and then quickly realized that uh, I didn't like programming. Uh, and so I stumbled into the, the networking aspect of computers. Uh, and as I was researching that, found security and just fell in love with it. And so I bought a bunch of books. I read those things cover to cover uh, and then uh, was fortunate enough to go to a, a school that had a, a focus on cybersecurity. And so got my first internship at that school doing uh, vulnerability scans of the campus uh, and then applied for a job that I wasn't qualified for at Mandiant, but you know, got lucky where they just started looking for college hires. And so uh, I showed up day one thinking I was going to be doing pen testing, uh, and they handed me a, a hard drive and said, "Here you go. You know, tell us everything that happened on it." And so I started learning forensics, and you know, thankfully, uh, I'm just a sponge and will soak up as much information as I can. I was sitting next to some of the smartest people in the industry, and so uh, I spent six years at Mandiant, uh, where uh, where I was really born and raised in incident response, and. You know, I did investigations into nation state threats in China, Russia, Iran. Uh, I did a bunch of investigations into uh, credit card theft because that was kind of the hot thing at that time. Uh, you know, this was back in the days of Anonymous and Lulsec where I was investigating the, the, the people who were in that group. Uh, and so just, you know, cut my teeth on a lot of really interesting uh, attacks. Uh, and then from Mandiant, I, I, I dove into the startup world. And so uh, I went to a company uh, called the Crypsis Group, uh, which is now a, a unit known as Unit 42. They, uh, they got acquired by Palo Alto. Uh, and that's where I really started getting in, uh, more experience in ransomware. And so this was back in 2016, where ransomware was just starting to take off. Uh, and I, I can remember early on where it was the first shift into what I call enterprise ransomware, where it's not just encrypting one or two systems, it's encrypting the entire organization. And so that started that trend where you know, it was just massive investigations into very large organizations that got hit with ransomware. Uh, and so I did that for a while, uh, you know, built out a, a professional services team there uh, and grew that team uh, to about 20, uh, 22 consultants. Uh, and then I, I, I stepped away for from incident response for the first time uh, and went into just do some business development work uh, in a, a network detection and response space. Uh, and then about a, a few years after that, I jumped straight back into the startup world uh, where I co-founded a company called Mox5. Uh, and with Mox5, the focus was on business recovery. So how do you get a company back up and running following a ransomware incident uh, as quickly as possible? Uh, and so that was my second uh, foray into incident response. Uh, and so I did that for another few years and, and built uh, the systems and handed the keys over and uh, to the next uh, the next wave of, uh, of leaders who, who wanted to jump into IR. Uh, and currently, I'm the uh, chief information security officer at Corvus Insurance, which is a, a cyber insurance carrier. Uh, and so I've got a little bit of a unique role now, uh, which is exactly how I like it, where I spend part of my time on internal security. Uh, I, sp I spend part of my time advising our policyholders. So kind of like think of it like vCISO type services. I, I run our uh, threat intel team. Uh, and then I spend a lot of time on our product. Uh, we have a product that runs a, a scan that collects information on companies and helps our underwriters uh, assess the likelihood of somebody having a security incident. And so, um, you know, it's a really cool kind of blend of uh a lot of different areas, which uh, keeps me busy, but uh, is super fun at the same time. Wow. See, I'd like to to say that I don't have a script for these podcasts, but I'd be lying. I mean, I do research. I stalk people on LinkedIn. I make some notes. And I had some notes for this conversation. 
And you might have seen me looking away from the screen. I've got a number of screens here. I'm like trying to reorder them because you've just completely thrown a curveball at me because what you've just said, I we could talk for about three or four hours. <laughs> um, I mean, I kind of started off at university and kind of did programming at university and quite quickly realized that that wasn't for me. Um, and then I went into playing games for a living and my mum told me, really, you're not going to make any money out of that. Never <laughs> forgiven her. Never forgiven her for telling me that. Um, and then I ended up doing a little bit of networking because you kind of had to back then. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really fall in love with that either. I mean, I, I went up the kind of CCNA, CCNP routes. I didn't quite get as far as kind of the route John took, but I, I didn't really enjoy that too much either. But I realized I needed the foundations. And that kind of, I stood on top of those foundations and it enabled me to do things like VMware. And if you can understand the flow of the packets, it's really, really quite useful. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, let's talk a little bit about I guess more about ransomware and actually about incident response in general. We we recorded a, a, a podcast not long ago, which will come out soon with Lisa Forte. Hmm. Um, she's English and she she was kind of doing this analogy of protecting uh, a vessel from pirates. So like a ship from, from pirates. And she was saying that that set her up quite well. That's kind of the job she did before she got into security. And she was saying that set her up quite well to be able to deal with kind of incident response. I'd like to ask you what do you what kind of set you up to do that? Was it something you were just passionate about, interested in, or do you think you've had something in your background that made you particularly kind of good and interested in doing that? Yeah, you know, it's it's an interesting skill set that you have to have. Uh, and it is something you can learn, but it, it really starts with a an intrinsic curiosity. Right. And so when when I was in high school, I would speed solve Rubik's Cubes. Right. I was I was that nerd. Uh, the thing, though, was that it built a, a pattern recognition that really became a superpower for me when it came to forensics, because the whole point of Rubik's Cubes is that you are looking for visual patterns and then you're applying an algorithm, you know, a series of moves to solve the cube. That's how you do it super quick. Right. Now, when you look at forensics and, you know, incident response, what are you doing? You're going in, you're collecting data from a system, and you're trying to recognize patterns that either exist to match an attacker, you know, doing something on the system, or you're taking a baseline for what's normal on a system and identifying patterns that don't match up with that. And so I was able to go in and take a look at, you know, thousands and thousands of lines of logs, and those patterns just stood out to me. Now, like, I, for me, I think that builds this investigative mindset. Right. And like early on in my career, when I started at Mandiant, uh, there was this guy, Jason Luckins. Uh, you know, we were traveling. It was the first time I ever traveled for work. Uh, and he's sitting me down uh, and he's, you know, giving me kind of the rundown on what IR is. And he says, listen, like your job is to put on your detective cap. Right. And you're going to find little pieces of information and that's going to lead you somewhere else. And you're going to follow that and you're going to rinse and repeat. Uh, and you know, that's, that's IR is you're following this yep. trail. And I think too, this is where you separate the good IR companies from the bad because the bad IR companies have a checklist and it's just like, I'm going to run this script. And if nothing comes up, then that system is clean, but that's not like, that's not how IR should no. be done. That might give you a baseline, but you really got to follow those breadcrumbs. And I think like that investigative mindset, that ability to, you know, quickly identify patterns, people who are good at those sorts of things those are the ones that really excel in in ir so so we we talk a lot about ransomware on this podcast and we see it in the press all the time and for me we're trying to stop ransomware happening in general there's a lot of kind of products out there and there's a lot of stuff that says let's just end ransomware now maybe this is a bit of a difficult topic to talk about but i don't think we'll we'll ever stop it if i'm honest but I also come across a lot of companies that believe they can fundamentally be 100% secure and therefore they don't bother with incident response. Now, me and John have both worked in an industry where we know things are going to fail. Hardware fails, software fails, people make mistakes, configuration errors happen. For me, incident response is an inevitable that you will unfortunately have to run that playbook at some point. And we talk quite a lot about practicing that playbook. There's no point in writing it practicing it say once every two years because the attacker changes the environment changes the ransomwares change and as you've said yourself ransomware 
came on the back of other threats that were there and no doubt it will evolve into something else so what is the point in having a playbook that just deals with something as of today and then never running it so really my question to you is what can people do to be prepared and how regularly do you think people should be testing because for me paying an external company to try and get in is a good idea them giving you results and saying we've tried to get in we've seen all these open doors go and close the doors i think that's a good idea but you should do that regularly don't do it once every five years because things change but what what is your opinion what is kind of your advice so I think it's going to vary based on the company you're dealing with, right? Uh, you know, you, you talk about pen tests, right? And uh, it, it's interesting because when I was in the thick of IR, you know, after we go and respond, somebody would ask, hey, should we get a pen test now? I was like, you just got a pen test, right? Like you got the real thing. You don't need another one. There's plenty <laughs> to learn from this one, right? So, you know, I think there's a lot of value in doing red team exercises because you can really, you can really see where your assumptions are wrong. Right. And this is where, you know, you go into these organizations and it's always it's always, everything's a matter of fact. Oh, you can't get to that system. Oh, no, somebody can't do this. They can't do that. Uh, and then, you know, the fact of the matter is every single time the attacker did exactly what the teams thought they, the attackers couldn't do. Right. And so you do need to do some stress testing there. I think that's more difficult for smaller organizations because, you know, it's it can be expensive. So, you know, this is where it's about how do you how do you take the different phases of an attack and break that down to the key controls that you would have to have, right? And we don't need to write a whole dissertation on this. It's like with ransomware, if you have better backups and they're secured, you are less likely to have to pay a ransom. Now, that doesn't stop the attacker from coming in, right? But it's a fail safe for you. And if you shift closer to the left here where you're getting closer to the attack, what are the main ways that ransomware actors are getting into the environment? Well, it's vulnerabilities, it's remote desktop, it's phishing emails. There are different controls you can put in place to address that. So you'll never get to 100% protection, as you said, right? And so if you can balance these protective measures and also work on how quickly can you detect and respond, now you have a fighting chance. And that's what this is about. It's just like reduce the blast radius as much as possible and get on that as quickly as possible. And now you can have something that would have been catastrophic, but now is more of just, you know, a, a little bit of a, a trip or a stumble. Yeah, so, so John, I was going to yeah. say, John, I didn't know if you had anything, but go for it. <laughs> yeah, question for you. I was on a panel um, about a month ago in uh, Columbus, Ohio at a Data Connectors conference. And it was about security threats with ransomware it was was top of mind. Uh, there was a question also on cyber insurance and ransomware. Um, and the answer I provided was, and it, it came from my experience in retail where we did a lot of PCI audits and uh, we'd have a you know a young kid come in just straight out of college, uh, didn't know a lot about IT, but he was enabled and powered. And he would just ask a series of questions and uh, would go through a series of check boxes. We'd have to show some validation, but it wasn't really in depth and it didn't really get to the heart of things. Uh, and when I answered this question at the panel about ransomware, I was like, you know, that's nice. Checking the boxes is great, but it also might be good to do some red teaming, uh, you know, to see if are these things, these, these procedures really in place? Are they actionable? Um, has the BCDR program been checked? Um, as you kind of look at the insurance side of things, is there a is there a need at some point to do some red teaming to really dive in and see if these uh, controls what people are saying is actually in place? So I, I think you you're hitting on a on a key challenge for cyber insurance, right? And that's the the attestation of controls because, and I, obviously I, I fully believe in cyber insurance, right? Uh, I, I think it it's a force of good because it can help create standards uh, across multiple industries. Uh, the challenge is that you're operating off of an application uh, that could be anywhere from five to 10 questions to 50 questions. And so you'll never get to the degree of uh, of coverage of something like uh, somebody going through a you know, PCI DSS, right? Uh, that in you know is probably one of the more comprehensive frameworks. But for an insurance carrier, that is a lot of work for somebody to go through to get a quote. 
Uh, and in a market where you're trying to sell insurance policies, if there are other carriers out there who will do it for fewer questions, you're, you know, that the insurance company is in a, in a bad bind, right? So if, if you take that to the next level of requiring uh, a third party attestation, whether that is, you know, the, the kid from college going in and asking for controls and validating it, you know, even if it's not to the, the greatest degree or a, a pen test. I think that is it's a pretty big barrier for for insurance carriers um, to have to battle. In a perfect world, though, you know, I, I think we have to get to this point where there is a secondary check, because I don't think it's out of malice where companies might be, um, you know, trying to hide the, the the ball on you know what the real controls are, but you know, in cybersecurity, there's a lot that's left to interpretation. And every individual might see a question and say, oh, this is what they mean. Oh, this is what they, they mean here. Uh, and so it's really difficult to really get down to what's the intent of the question? How do you portray that? And how can somebody accurately answer that? I, I think it's the same challenge with third party risk management right now, where, you know, how do you properly validate the controls of this third party that balances the time investment to uh, and, and cost? To, to actually give you an accurate representation of their security. I guess the, the point of my question is, um, I talked to a number of CISOs out there and I won't name any names, uh, but the impression I get is, hey, I got cyber insurance. It's, it's, it, it becomes a crutch. You know, if mm -hmm. I'm, if I'm breached, eh, you know, I don't, I don't need to put all that investment into that security program because I got insurance and, and, uh, if I'm ransomware, eh, they'll pay out. Um, that I guess that's why I'm, I'm saying, hey, maybe it's time to raise the bar up. Uh, you've already seen it in the automotive insurance. Uh, I think it's Progressive has Snapshot where you you know you load an app on your phone, and um, my understanding is it tracks your driving habits. And you know if you're you know a speed racer on on the freeway and you're going 75 on a regular basis, your 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 costs are going to go up. Um, and I think that's that's one of the things I, my concern is is some of these leaders look at security is, hey, I got, I'm insured, so I don't need to invest in that program. Yeah. I, and that's a very dangerous thought, right? You know, w whenever we're talking about risk, you, you always have the ability to transfer that risk. But when you're looking at that from just a monetary standpoint, then I'm going to transfer uh, that risk over and I'll get reimbursed, right? It's like you're forgetting about all the collateral damage. Uh, you know, I don't think there's anyone, I hope there's not at least, that gets car insurance and feels that they can go drive recklessly because it's okay. They've got car insurance. It'll cover their medical bills. It'll cover a new car, right? Uh, you know, it's it's a harder translation over to cyber. Uh, but yeah, it's anyone that is is thinking along those lines uh, is, is thinking along a very dangerous path. Uh, and so, you know, this is where uh, it's part of your cybersecurity practice to have insurance, but it's more of a business risk mitigation rather than a technical control limitation, which I think is where, you know, security practitioners should should really be spending most of their time not using insurance as that crutch. I, I think, to be honest, I totally agree with you. Apart from if you've got a rental car and you've got full insurance, <laughs> then you can drive it however you like, right? Um, it brings us nicely on to, to an article and, and, and that I read this week in, and Zero Trust. So I... Um, and I can't remember, I'll have to look it up and put it in the notes when we release the podcast. But I, I read something on LinkedIn this week that said that there's a company out there that's proposing a zero trust maturity model. Um, so I guess I've got a number of kind of questions for you around zero trust. The first question is kind of, do you believe in it? Do you think it's a buzzword or not? And, and the second question is, if there is such a thing as a maturity model within zero trust and you can reach level one, level two, level three, four, five, whatever, and it was happened to help you make your insurance cheaper, for instance, if you were at level five versus level two. Do you think it's a good idea? So the first question is, is it a buzzword? And are you hearing about zero trust? And like, do you believe in it and comments on it? And the second one is, do you think from a um, insurance point of view, it's it's a worthwhile thing to have? Yeah, it's I mean, zero trust is everywhere right now. Uh, and it, it is totally a, a buzzword. Um, but it. At its core, the philosophy behind it is where I think we have to go as an industry, right? So, you know, leave it to security companies to ruin a good uh, a good word uh, and take advantage <laughs> of it. So, you know, here we are now. 
But you know, I think it captures a lot of the 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 different philosophies that we we have to adopt, right? We shouldn't be trusting everything to connect in. We should be increasing the monitoring and looking for you know suspicious things. We should be ensuring that you only have access to the things you need, right? You know, every security program, if you had that fully implemented, you know, that's the dream, right? You know, getting there is super difficult, uh, especially you know with the hodgepodge of you know different technology that's out there, but you know, I do think it's something that everyone should strive for, you know, from the insurance aspect of it, you know, it's, you, you have to, you have to take into consideration that the insurance space is, is usually a couple years behind where technology is, right? And so there's a yep. learning curve for, uh, for the, you know, the less technical uh, insurance companies out there uh, to really see what works and what's not working. So, you know, I, I can't see something with a, a zero trust mandate coming down the pipeline in the next couple of years, you know, maybe in three to five years. It really depends on how quickly that technology evolves and how easy it is to implement in an organization. Um, but, you know, from a, a, an insurance carrier's perspective, they're looking at it more from a control side of it, right? Less so, you know, framework. Um, but, you know, things might be based on frameworks, right? So, you know, example, right? Every insurance carrier got burned with ransomware. And so suddenly you started seeing backups be mandated and then it became secure backups because you saw hackers going after <laughs> yeah. the backups. So, you know, I think there are components of that, you know, of zero trust, uh, you know, you've got MFA requirements. Um, you know, I think in the future we might start seeing device um, uh, requirements. Uh, you know, you might start seeing additional monitoring, things of that. It's, you know, the current state of insurance, the most common things you're gonna see required are EDR, MFA and backups, right? And those are all things that tie into the two biggest costs for cyber insurance, ransomware and business email compromise. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've been at a few events over the last couple of weeks and you, you walk around now, me and John commented about RSA last year and every vendor's got, we sell zero trust. And uh, I don't believe zero trust is a product. I believe it can be a combination of products. There are products out, out there that can help with it. But one of the, the key things I talk about when I talk about zero trust is getting the fundamentals right. Mm -hmm. And having an EDR is great. Having all those things are great. But have you configured it correctly? And yeah. and even even more than that, but and, and I remember this from, from living in the corporate world. We used to have users leave the business and we'd get told six months later, or you might hear through the grapevine that so-and-so left and you'd be like, but he's been logging in every day for the last six months. And he may not have known he's been logging in because his VPN just would connect and he was just still using his laptop. So not only did we not take his equipment off of him or her, we didn't disable their account. They don't even know they're connected to the VPN. All the browsing they've been doing was still being back called. And it's like, if we don't get those things right, buying any form of products just going to be a waste of time. So you, you really... and and. We were talking about this before on this call that we would have tick boxes. We would get audited. We would have somebody come in from one of the big four and they'd be like, do you have an EDR? Yes or no. Do you have this? Do you have that? Do you have this? You very rarely ever saw, do you have a HR policy about levers? And if you've got one, can you prove that you've actually used it? And we talk about backups. I mean, it was one of those, the amount of companies that I've known that do backups, but don't ever test them. Mm -hmm. So you've actually, I mean, people still backing up with tape. I don't have a problem with that, but it's like they don't last forever. And I, I, in a, in a company that I never worked for, but I went and visited a friend and their backup tapes were sat on the shelf in the sunlight and it was in America and it was hot. It was in California. And I'm like, have you ever tried those tapes that say like end of year 2015 and it's now 2018 and it's been sat there in the burning sunlight? Like, do you, do you, and, and we just, as much as I truly believe zero trust is, is a philosophy and a strategy and, and it's a cultural shift and all of that, and we should be doing it. You can't just try and do that when you haven't fixed all your other problems. And therefore, I think insurance companies can have a role to play in making sure that, that like, as John said, the bar gets raised a little bit and we do the really basic stuff. Because you see companies getting compromised. And we had a company in the UK, a telecoms company in the UK that got kind of attacked six times in five years. It might have been five times in six years. Like, 
how have you not learned from the first time or the second or the third time? It's like raising a child. I mean, you let them make the mistake once. And after the third time, you're like, why'd you keep doing it? Uh, and it's just crazy. Um, but John, let me, let me uh, of, I want to on. comment on that too. Um, you, you raise, you, you mentioned uh, raising a child and, and uh, um, ransomware. And I think now what we're seeing is in a lot of, at least in the United States, the parents are starting to show up. So uh, in, I think there's a legislation on the books in about 45 of uh, the states. Um, we also have the federal government, uh, the Biden executive order on zero trust, uh, the recent announcement of the cybersecurity strategy uh, by the Biden administration as well. And then we have uh, state regulators starting to get involved. So uh, New York DFS is a great example of this. They had a regulation that came out uh, 500, I believe it was in 2017. Um, and it was it was pretty groundbreaking, but now they've gone back and based on, interestingly enough, ransomware, uh, they're updating those regulations. They're expected to be released gosh, any day now, and uh, will go into effect sometime this summer. But it calls out the need for a CISO, uh, that you must have a, a DR, BCR program, and it must be you know attested to. Then it calls out for things like, and, and you mentioned this earlier, Jason, risk-based authentication, um, authentic, uh, inventory, vulnerability management. It's really an example where regulators are changing the game and becoming much more prescriptive in the approach. Um, do you think this will have an impact on things like ransomware? Do you think it'll have an impact on how people, you know, we, I talked a little bit about uh, using insurance as a crutch, um, that companies will now have to get real about cybersecurity? Because the other side of the New York uh, DFS is they're getting serious about fines. Uh, they're getting serious about if you don't hit the bars, we're going to pull your ability to sell insurance. Um, do you see this, you know, this move to more public regulation uh, or legislature uh, mandating certain standards for cybersecurity? Do you see that going forward or do you believe that the market will kind of take care of things? I, I do see it as a positive step forward, uh, you know, as you were talking about before, right? Like we, we need a minimum bar in security uh, and it's, it's as much for the CISO who is just trying their their damnedest to get the budget that they need, uh, but can't persuade the business, right? Regulation can be that backstop saying, hey, you know what? If you don't do this, here's a representation of all the fines you can get. Uh, sometimes for business leaders, that's still not enough. Uh, and then, you know, for, you know, the security team there, maybe they need to question uh, whether that's the right company for them. But, you know, overall, I think it's something that is going to help move the needle. Uh, where I struggle with it, and I, this is certainly not a reason not to pursue it, is the time delay in, in these things, right? So, you know, ransomware is a great example. Uh, ransomware is just an extortion-based crime. It is one tool in the toolkit for these attackers. So even if tomorrow you've got, you know, Microsoft comes out and claims we have solved ransomware on Windows systems, right? You know, celebrate the victory. These attackers are not just going to go away, right? They're going to find ways to bypass it and find another way to monetize their attacks. Uh, and so, you know, we see this stuff happening now uh, where, you know, MFA, the, the tried and true method for protecting your accounts, hackers are finding ways to bypass weaker forms of it. If you look at DFS as an example, they may require MFA, but it doesn't go as far to say phishing resistant MFA or what forms, right? And it might take two or three years for that to happen, uh, and so there's always going to be this lag time. So I think you have to have these regulations be that minimum bar. And then the question becomes, can these vendors, the product vendors, try to push the narrative forward for newer technologies, uh, you know, things that do utilize zero trust concepts and features uh, to try to jump companies ahead and reduce the, the pain in between. So it's just like it's this constant push and pull and like, it's how do we condense that time down as much as possible so that we are reacting quickly, legislation is happening quicker, and we're getting companies to move that that uh, that security maturity forward uh, to keep pace with attackers. Yeah, I mean, we, we've said before, um, and we and we talk about it quite often that it used to be that to secure your company, you just spent money on your environment. 
and the big companies had a lot of money to spend. So the big companies would spend the money and be more protected. We've now got global supply chains. So the supply chain can have 50 companies in it, 75 companies in it. And unless you like secure every one of those companies in that supply chain to the same level, it only takes the hacker to get into one place. And then because of trust, and we're talking about trust again, you trust everyone in your supply chain. And therefore, you get in at the weakest place and you travel up the supply chain. And I mean, I've worked most of my career for manufacturing companies. And we would have manufacturing of, of small parts that may be a, a two-man company, a five-man company. It may be a, a person in his garage somewhere just soldering one thing because it was 75 years old and he's the only person it had been passed down by generations. He's the only one that knows how to make it. That person's emailed in you via Hotmail, Google, or equivalent. They get compromised with a ransomware. They accidentally send it on to everyone in their address list. And that happens to go into a company and probably multiple companies because they're probably walking for multiple people. Everybody knows Bill in the garage. They they read Bill's email. It says something like, please fill out this form. Click, boom, off you go. Suddenly all supply chains infected. And, and therefore, businesses are going to have to help each other. And w unfortunately, we work in an environment where there's competition. Everybody wants to outdo each other. The vendors, the, the everybody's trying to sell. We're all in business. We want to do better than the person either higher up the food chain, further down the food chain. But what people don't realize is we have to be in this fight together. And I, I what I really like about LinkedIn and the cyber community and also what you're doing with Teach Me Cyber, and we'll get onto that in a minute. But I like the fact that the community of people is friendly and helping each other. But I think it needs to kind of go up a level where business leaders need to get together and talk about we are doing X and we are doing Y. Historically, I don't think that's happened necessarily at the business leader point of view. I mean, me and John go to a lot of events and we have good communities and we have a good network and we talk amongst our peers and we try and help as do you and other people. But it needs the CEO and the people like the board and the non-execs to be talking about how do we as a whole rid the world of these cyber threats? And I don't, I mean, maybe I'm living in a, a dream world where that's possible, but I think it has to happen. Otherwise you will get somebody in, in the supply chain, get attacked and it will take down all supply chains and it, and, and you're going to, you've seen it or, or we've seen statistics recently where supposedly ransomware is dropping off. And we've talked a, a before on a, on a previous podcast where actually, is it just dropping off in visible areas? Is it just dropping off where the FBI are keeping an eye on it? And maybe it's increased in other areas. And funnily enough, it may have increased in those areas that are low cost economies where all these manufacturing companies manufacture all their stuff because you don't want to make a noise in America because everyone's looking at it. So what you'll do is you'll make a noise in Taiwan or India or South America or some places where the government maybe aren't focusing on it. And then you're still in the same problem. Um, John, anything you want to add before we kind of pivot? No, let's let's pivot over. OK, so so Jason, I, I, I said this before we started recording that quite often I do these podcasts and it feels like I'm talking to friends because I've seen people's faces on LinkedIn and I've seen you publish stuff. And we see this all the time and it, it's quite a it feels a bit funny. I mean, I bumped into people at an event I was at this week and you kind of give them a hug like you've known them forever and I've never met them. Um, but you do a lot with Teach Me Cyber. So t tell us about it. What is it? Why did you just start it? Why are you doing it? That kind of stuff. Yeah, so it actually, it echoes off of what you were just talking about. You know, what what I've noticed throughout my career is that you have a, a lot of technical people that when they're talking to less technical or non-technical audiences, they don't change the way they communicate. Uh, and so it's really difficult for security people to to have a, a real conversation and a productive conversation with their CEO um, because they they don't know how to properly communicate the risks, right? Like you can't go into a board level discussion and start talking about encryption layers and you know, you know all these different terms that you know these people aren't going to understand because they just uh, you know it's just not going to be, the outcome that you're looking for. And so, um, you know, Teach Me Cyber came from frustration, honestly, where, 
you know, I was l reading a bunch of different articles and and seeing things. And I'm just like, even in these these articles that are meant for mass media, they're they're spouting misinformation. They're misconstruing the reality of what you know what's going on in the ground. And so, you know, for me, it was like, how do I take the things that I'm seeing in the threat landscape and translate these into you know a mechanism or medium that anyone can understand? Uh, and so, you know, it started off as a bit of an experiment uh, for for the insurance space. You know, how can I level up some of the underwriters? How can I help level up some of the brokers um, by passing on, you know, these this translated knowledge so that they can take that and and help them in their day to day jobs? And, you know, it really just kind of went from there. And, you know, the end goal here is just how do we help educate anyone that is interested in cybersecurity um, more about like what's going on? And for me, you know, I always take the attack angle. Uh, you know, obviously, I grew up in the IR side, but uh, you know what I learned going to school and studying cybersecurity and you know system administration and networking was there's a very academic approach to learning cybersecurity, and then there's the reality of what actually happens, right? You know, I the number of times that I've used the phrase uh, or the term buffer overflow in a conversation and in incident response, I can count on one hand because it just doesn't matter, right? What matters is how are attackers breaking into organizations? How are they moving from system to system? And how are they stealing the data? How are they encrypting systems, right? You don't have to go to this low level understanding to get the picture of what has to happen to help mitigate that. And so that's where I think like the attacks that happen make amazing stories and really good learning opportunities as to the, the why you should invest in cybersecurity and where are the, the common failure points? Because there's one thing I learned from doing IR is it it's a pattern, right? Like, you know, it got to the point where it's like, I'm playing Mad Libs with these attacks where it's the same story every time. You're just swapping out company names and some malware names, but it's the same thing every time. And so that's the hope with Teach Me Cyber is, you know, how can we take these, these technical concepts, boil them down to the most simple terms, so that everyone can understand it and get on a level playing field so that we can have a more constructive conversation on security. Yeah, for, for me, I think I spent all of my career trying to work. I mean, let's step back a bit. Cyber wasn't a thing when I started my career. I mean, people didn't have passwords. People just kind of turned up at the PC and, and it was on. That was it. And then so kind of InfoSec and cyber has evolved out of IT. But we've always had the communication situation where nerdy people and sorry for everyone out there but i'm a nerd and i think john's a nerd and you're probably a nerd the nerdy people were were given the job of explaining the stuff that we understand the nerdy stuff to boards of directors and funnily enough most of us don't really want to talk to anybody let alone the board of directors um but it, it, you have to learn that skill so i totally agree with trying to help what what you're doing but i also think boards and senior teams are starting to change as well. I, I saw another article on LinkedIn recently where it was talking about, do we need the CISO on the board or do we need at least the board to understand a bit more of the technical stuff? And that's not to say that they need to be an IT specialist or a cyber specialist, but they need to, they need to try and educate themselves as well. So we have an onus on us as kind of leaders in our field, but they have an onus to try and understand and I think as we're now starting to teach people cyber at a younger age and it's around them and it's everywhere and you have to know what MFA is to, to log in your online games and everything. I have, again, I, I'm very much a dreamer. I have this dream that in 15, 20 years when those younger people are, are maybe leaders of businesses, they'll have a better understanding. Um, I think so. You know, the, the thing that you got to keep in mind too is, right, what, where do the attacks go in 10 to 20 years, right? So like, yeah. It's like we we're, we level up the education and then the attackers level up. And so it's like, how do we keep that conversation going so that, you know, 15 to 20 years, not only does somebody know what MFA is, but they also understand, like, what's the controls of today that we have to have in place? So I, yeah. I think it's definitely a step forward. It's I think we still have more work to do to make sure that 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 education continues beyond just, you know, uh, learning, you know, when you are logging into some game and having to do MFA, like I think. And the current security training is not cutting it, right? So yeah. it's like, we're not going to rely on that uh, to do it. But there's there's definitely more work to go. But it's it's the fight worth fighting. Because otherwise, 
you know, we're just going to be stuck in, in where we are today. So I've just looked down at the clock and I do this in every podcast and realize we've got about 10 minutes left. I mean, I'd love you to come back on. There's so much more stuff I want to ask you and so much more we want to talk about. I was going to ask you a little bit about training and resume hacks and all that, but we'll have to maybe do that another time. So let, let's pivot to a little bit of fun question. Sure. And for me, it's going to have to be food, right? Um, and John's going to laugh. I was going to ask you if you like pineapple on pizza, but John, every time someone says yes, I get horrified and it upsets me. So I'm not going to ask you. Um, what's been your best um, food experience? And it doesn't necessarily have to be that the food was amazing, but the experience, it might be, I don't know, top of Everest, having a sandwich or something. What 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 was the kind of best food experience? Oh, wow. Uh, and when you put it in that regard, there's there's quite a few things. Uh, I'll, I'll share this to start. Uh, so I never really appreciated food until I met my wife who loves to cook. So when I was a bachelor, uh, I was the guy who would have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and a yep. big thing of chocolate milk for dinner. Um, and so I'd say, you know, there's certainly aspect where my wife likes to experiment with food and she creates some of the most amazing things. And I'm the most fortunate person in the world that she loves to do that. Uh, and I will clean the dishes every day, uh, just to experience that. Um, but I would say, uh, one of the most memorable things was having a granola bar at the end of one of the most amazing hikes that I ever experienced. And, uh, that is like, you know, just one of those core memories for me where my wife and I are just sitting down and we got the ocean behind us, super windy, just gnawing on a, on a granola bar. Uh, you know, that was, I think that's like one of the heights for me. And what was the hike then? I'm going to have to ask that now. Where was so, it? So uh, it was an unexpected hike. Uh, my wife and I uh, were in, uh, in Hawaii on the big island. Uh, and uh my wife says, oh, we're going to do this hike. It's like the southernmost point of the U.S., right? So we're like, mm. we got to check this out. Uh, and so we go there and my wife was looking this up and she's like, oh, it's just a, a mile out and in. We're like, okay, that's easy. Um, but it turns out it was a three mile hike to get to the end and then a three mile hike back. But it was some of the most amazing landscape uh, I've ever experienced. And it was just it more special because we didn't know what to expect. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, it was just an amazing moment. Sounds amazing. I've never been over to Hawaii, so I'm going to have to go at some point. But John. Yeah, I, I know this place. Uh, my wife and I went there. I think there's some wind turbines in that area as well. Yep. Um, yeah, I know exactly where you're talking about. Um, question in your opening uh, statement or your opening statement. Your opening uh, introduction. <laughs> the deposition. Yeah, I, 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 the, too much legislation in my head these days. Um <laughs> You mentioned uh, Unit 42 uh, and, uh, you know, Rick Howard was the guy behind the naming of that, obviously, based on a book. Um, and he created the uh, the cybersecurity canon, uh, again, to encourage people to read about cybersecurity. Since you probably know about that, what and, and the, the, the number of books that are in the cybersecurity canon, uh, what book recommendation would you have? So I am going to go against the grain here. Uh, I don't read cybersecurity books. Oh, uh, wow. I find more value out of other books uh, that I can draw parallels to. Uh, and so, you know, I I always go back and forth on this. And should I should I force myself to read a cybersecurity book? And this is outside of like the hardcore stuff. If like you need a reference manual or anything like that, um, but. I am a, a product of somebody who has been fortunate to work with some of the smartest people in the industry. And so I always got more value out of asking questions uh, out of people and seeing things live. Uh, and now with the internet, they're like it's obviously super easy to get any piece of information you need. And so for me, where I get more value is what other books can I be reading that I can draw parallels from and really help support, you know, thinking in a different way uh, in security. So yeah, my my bookshelf is feel is filled with uh with business books, with leadership books. Uh it will be very, very few uh uh security books, probably outside of the ones that I first read to get interested in security. So, so do you a, have um give us an example? Give us an example. I because I, I, I love that approach. Uh, you know, adjacent possible is 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 ringing in my head. Um, do you have any recommendations? Yeah, for books in general? Sure. Uh, so let's see. Um, and I'm going to tie this to security. Um, 
and I'm, I'm blanking on their names uh, right now. There's there's a book on, uh, I love books on communication and storytelling. And so I think every security professional should read books on on how to tell stories. Uh, there's one from there, there's a, 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 a a group that does these these uh, speaking things and like storytelling competitions, and I'm, I'm blanking on the name. It's it's on my shelf there. Uh, that book teaches you how to tell a more compelling story. So for a CISO, going and having yeah. a conversation with their board, put things in stories because that's how I mean that's how mm -hmm. humans operate. That's how we've operated for millions of years, right? Uh, even if we haven't been around for that long, but <laughs> you know, this is where you know if you can tell a more compelling story and and really guide people along, I think you're going to go a long way. There's another book on uh, on basically uh, like essentialism and saying no, uh, and I think this is really important in security. Yeah. Uh, and it's not because uh, we want to be the place of no. I would actually greatly advocate against that. It's more of how do you prioritize the things that matter most? Uh, because with security, like everything is always on fire, and there's always going to be an area where there's going to be a leak, right? But you only have ten fingers; you can only plug so many holes. So how do you really learn to understand like what is the most important thing for you to be focusing on and what should you be saying no to and what should you be saying yes to? So Yeah, I think that's very good advice. I was going to ask you, have you read The Art of War? I have not read The Art of War. It's been on my list forever, um, but I have not read it. And that's like the one book like every security person is supposed to read too. That's not a, a tech book, but haven't done that one yet. And have you, have you read it, John? I've read bits and pieces of it. So I was given that book um, by a mentor of mine who actually happened to be my boss. And then we're still in touch now. And he gave me a few other ones. And he was like, read this. It will really help you. And he gave me a kind of an original, like an original translation from, I think it was Chinese originally. And there's a lot of new ones now that are cut down and stuff. But I definitely would advise reading it because it's, although it's called The Art of War, it's really how how not to go into battle and it's quite an interesting one um i thank you very much for coming along i mean it's great we'd love you to come back again i mean i i've got like a third of the way through my questions and we kind of diverged a little bit but it's always great i mean i i like what you're doing like i said i i almost feel like i know you because i've seen you on linkedin but i i always read stuff you've done some stuff about resume hacks that are quite interested and i think what you're doing is very good um so th so thank you um john anything you want to add no this was a uh, another great insight into you know the insurance agents insurance industry as well as you know best practices and if you're a CISO, 100 percent agree with you learn to tell stories uh don't go in there with a bunch of mumbo jumbo tech talk uh bring it bring in an analogy make something relevant make it yeah. hit home all right, well, thanks for having me, guys. Really enjoyed the time and definitely uh, have to do this again. Thank you very much. Thank you.